these spaces are not separate. They overlap. And in fact, the Garden of Eden is described throughout the Bible as a high mountain garden where heaven and earth are one. Cool. So that's the world. Now it needs some creatures. God first creates and appoints the sun, moon, and stars to rule the day and night. You mean the giant flaming gas balls in the sky? Well, that's how you think about them. But the biblical authors, like all ancient people, saw them as heavenly creatures that are glorious, shining bright, and high above. Which is strange. I don't think of stars as creatures. Well, you don't. But for the biblical authors, the stars formed their categories for thinking and talking about a spiritual reality that exists alongside ours. And it's a different kind of reality, just like the sky is different from the land. And it's populated with creatures that have different kinds of bodies, shiny spiritual bodies. Okay, so almost all ancient cultures thought of the stars as divine beings, including the ancient Israelites. But the biblical authors make clear that these beings are not God. Rather, they're images of God. Their glory and high status is a reflection of the Creator's glory and status, and they exist to serve His purposes. So the stars symbolize beings who are like God's heavenly staff team. Right. Now let's go back, because after God appointed the heavenly host, He also appointed another type of creature. The humans. Yeah, in Hebrew they're called Adam, which sounds like the Hebrew word for dirt because that's what they're made of. So glorious rulers above and hairy sapiens below. But then comes the great twist. God tells the lowly humans that they are to rule all of creation. He invites them to rise above their dirty origins and share in God's glory as his partners. So God wants to rule the world through humans and not the spiritual beings. Exactly. This is how the poet of Psalm 8 understood the stories of Genesis. He looked up at the stars and says, What is humanity that you consider him? You made him lower than the spiritual beings, but crowned him with glory and divine majesty. This is humanity's high calling, to rule creation in the love and power of God. Very cool. But not everyone's happy. We're introduced to a spiritual being who doesn't want humans to rule. So he tricks them into thinking that they can get divine power on their own terms. They're deceived and they take the opportunity. So they're banished from the Eden mountain, exiled to wander the earth and return to the dust. This snake is bad news. Yeah, and as you read on, you discover that he's part of a spiritual rebellion that follows the humans outside of Eden, and things get worse from here. The humans still desire to rule, so they start a new project. Yes, in the Bible, this is called Babylon. It's the anti-Eden, where human and spiritual rebels join together to elevate themselves back to their former glory. And so, with all that in mind, we can now appreciate the full cast of characters that we meet in the biblical story. God, humans, and all of the spiritual beings. Exactly. And so here's a preview of what we're going to explore. We'll learn more about God's heavenly staff team called the Divine Council. Then we'll talk about angels and cherubim, key figures in the spiritual realm. And then one particular angel called the Angel of the Lord. We'll also look at the spiritual rebels in the Bible, connected with the Satan and demons. And finally, we'll see how this whole story leads to Jesus, the one who overcomes evil, reunites heaven and earth, so that a new humanity can partner with God. You just watched a video introducing spiritual beings in the story of the Bible. And what's fascinating is how they all belong to a class of beings that in Hebrew are called Elohim. This is a hard word to translate, and so that's what we're going to explore next.
Good morning, everybody. It's so great to see you. Go ahead, stand up on your feet. I got some great news for you. It doesn't matter what you walked in here with this morning. That battle belongs to Jesus Christ. Let's sing it together. Come on. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, God, you see a mountain moved. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. When I fight, come on. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you.
Oh, the perfect Son of God in all his innocence. Here walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering. Oh, blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. Some imagine you are distant. Chased us down in merciful pursuit. To the sinner you were grace, and the broken you embraced. And in the end, the proof was in your wounds. Come on, sing that in the end. In the end, the proof was in your wounds. There's a God who weeps, there's a God who pleads, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the sun. Promises are for us. Come on, y'all, let's sing this in faith. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood still speaking, your love still reaching, all praise. King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes of my healing. All praise, King Jesus, glory to God in heaven. Your blood, come on, still seeking, your love still reaching. All praise. battle is not yours, it's God's. Whatever battle you're going through, the weapons we fight with aren't 
physical weapons. They're spiritual weapons. Our weapons are prayer. Our weapons are worship. What would happen when the people of God sing? Enemy shudders. The darkness is pushed back. I want you to know, I want us to know the inheritance we have today, y'all. We have the promises of God. We're going to sing that one more time. There is something on offer for us today. The cross covers. His blood speaks a better word. Come on. So let's, let's sing that one more time. And in faith, whatever you're going through, know that your words carry power in the kingdom. Let's sing that again. Your cross, my freedom. Your stripes, my healing. All praise, King Jesus. Glory to God in heaven. Your blood still speaking. Your love still reaching all praise king jesus glory to god one more time let's sing that again your cross my freedom your stripes my healing all praise king jesus glory to god in heaven your blood still speaking your love still reaching all praise King Jesus glory to God forever
throne of glory, high and lifted up. Your presence fills the temple when we worship you. God, you are here right now. Man, you're here. God, you're here. Thank you. Thank you, God, for this morning. Thank you for right now, God. Thank you that your presence fills the temple, God. Jesus, thank you that you're leading this entire thing this morning. We love you. Thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, you guys can take a seat. And as you take a seat, give somebody a hug, a high five, uh, you know, kiss on the cheek, whatever you honestly want to do. So, you know, just don't go too far. Hey, my name is Talon Hawthorne. Um, I help lead the young adult ministry here at New Spring Church here in Anderson. Um, so if you're a young adult, Sylvia, there we go. If you're a young adult here, part of Rally, can you guys make some noise? Let's go, let's go. Hey, last week you went to go see Top Gun and it was great. Let's go, it was, let's go smile, I love it, I love it. Hey, and if you're a young adult here um, and you're new here, my name is Talon, like I said. And if you wanna get be a part of this young adult crew that was just making some noise, come and find me in the atrium after the gathering. I would love to help you guys get connected. And also, if you're new here, I wanna say welcome. Welcome to New Spring Church. There we go, you guys can clap, there we go. I was Ty, let's go. I wasn't expecting you to clap, let's go, let's go. Hey, I'll say this, back, I came to New Spring for the first time in 2013 when I was in high school uh, through Fuse, and Fuse changed my life, and being at New Spring has changed my life, but Jesus has used this church, New Spring Church, to change my life. And if he's done it for you in here, actually, let's like, if, he, if he's done that for you, can you make some noise as well? Like there's, I feel, I feel, I feel and I sense this joy in the room right now. Um, and I think joy is, is something that's so powerful, um, especially against, against the strongholds of the enemy. So I'm so like, thankful that we get to do this and be here together. And, and if, you're, if you're new here as well, um, New Spring Church, our aim and our goal is to see everyone, everywhere in the everyday relationship with Jesus. Our heart is to see everyone, everywhere in the everyday relationship with Jesus. So for me, I want to see you be in an everyday relationship with Jesus. It is the most beautiful thing on the planet, in the entire universe, to be in an everyday relationship with Jesus. Um, and my hope, and my hope is that you will step into that as well. Um, and also, if you came here and you want to give, uh, we have a couple different ways you can give. You know, through ties and offers, all this every week. Um, but it's something that's so like profound. I know sometimes it can become like white noise talking about giving. Um, but it's something that, as well, in high school, I started to do, and it genuinely has changed my life. Like uh, deciding to give my first fruits to God from like the money that I'm receiving in, I begin to see blessings. I, I begin to see the promise in Malachi 3:10 that God has opened up the floodgates in my life um, because I feel like taking this one step of obedience and, and giving for the first time. So if you want to give, um, we have these brown boxes around the room, as you can see. Maybe you can't see them because it's a little dark over there. Or you can give online at newspring.cc, or you can give on the app. Uh, so we have a couple of ways you can do that. And also, if it's your first time um, and you've never given before or you're new and you've never given before, or maybe you've been here for years and you've never given before, I just want to ask, 
maybe today is the day that you're meant to step in. And maybe you've been thinking about this for a long time. And this is your sign from heaven to some people, you know, you might need that. This, this, this is your, you know, this is me saying that, hey, if this is a conviction you've been feeling for a long time, maybe it's time to step into that today. Let's go. Hey, well, I'm deeply excited about what I what I sense that God is, is going to do today. Uh, today we're going to start a new series uh, on spiritual warfare. Um, but to start out, I think we need to change it up a little bit, you know, and like let's you know do some do something new. So can everybody stand up? Can everybody stand up? And we're going to read some scripture collectively together as a family. Um, who likes scripture? Make some noise. You like scripture? Listen. The Word of God is good, man. It's good. So I want to write uh, Rashonda out here. So Rashonda, she serves with our discipleship and our connections ministries. Um, And she's been a part of our house for a long time. She's a mother of this campus, in my opinion. And I went to school with your son, uh, Raekwon, as well. Um, And Raekwon is 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 a good man. And I'm so thankful that you're going to read some scripture for us today. So we're going to be in Ephesians uh, verses, uh, Ephesians 6. And Rashonda's Rashonda's going to take us away. All right. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Again, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with, the, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. That's the word of God. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so for this entire series, we're going to be doing this uh, reading scripture together to start our to start our um, to start the preach. But I'm going to pray for us before we go into this time before Pastor Brad comes out. So let's all let's pray together. Um, so Jesus, thank you, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is powerful, that it's beautiful, and that it's living, that it's active. Um, thank you for um, being here with us this morning. And my and I want to ask you um, to be with us this morning as we go uh, into this time. And we love you, Jesus, in your name. That we pray, Amen. Amen, amen. How are we, people of God? Am I doing all right on all of our campuses? Hey, can we put our hands together for the folks that read the word this morning, got us ready for church? Good to see everyone, whether you're on one of our campuses today or whether you're tuning in from the beach because it's now officially summer break. Uh, I know that some of the kiddos got done with school this week, at least mine did. So we put our, uh, our, our hearts into the summertime and we cranked up full on summertime at my house. Today is actually uh, our baby boy's birthday. He is three today. And uh, so he's not gonna hear you clap, but he's pumped up and we're pumped up. He got a dog for his birthday. So we got a new dog at our house. So pray for us. The dog was up at 2 a.m. last night uh, making noise in the middle of the night, and it's the first week of a spiritual warfare series. Amen? Amen, everybody. Well, I hope you're doing well. If you got your Bible, uh, I want you to open it up. I want you to open up your notes as well, or you can open up the notes app. We're starting a seven-week series on spiritual warfare today, and I can't wait. I've been looking forward to this. Your teaching team can't wait. Uh, we're looking forward to this, and uh, let me give you a little, while you're getting your notes kind of ready and, and, you know, getting prepared, I'm going to give you a little bit of, a, of a, a primer as to why. So New Spring Church has been an actual church for 22 and a half years. Some of you guys know that. And uh, we've had a website for the majority of that time. And uh, one of the cool things about a website is you can watch analytics. You can see what people want to know about. You can see what what articles they visit, what, what videos they visit. What, and did you know at New Spring Church, in the history of our church, the number one most visited page in terms of topics uh, at our church is around the topic of spiritual warfare. 
in the history of our church, I could bring out the stats and put analytics in front of you today. What you need to know is people come to our website and look up spiritual warfare. Where does it come from? What, what can I do about it? What do I need to know about it? How, how can I operate in life? It is the number one place that people land on our webpage. The only page on our site that gets more traction than spiritual warfare is www.newspring.cc, the homepage. Yeah. It's the only one. So here's the whole point. I want to put this in front of us before we begin and dive in, is that your neighbors, your kids, your spouse, your future spouse, can I get an amen from a single person in the room? Your future spouse, your, your, your grandbabies, the person that moved into your apartment complex, the person that just relocated here into your subdivision that you've walked past as you walk your dog. The people in our communities have questions about spiritual warfare and they're looking for answers. And what I aim and what we aim to do is to get your questions answered and allow you to be someone who might be able to answer the questions of your kids, your grandkids, your neighbor. This is something that people want to know about. You don't even have to go to church to have a question. You can sense that there's something more than the five senses going on in the earth. And people's eyes and ears don't pick up on the unseen, the heavenly places. But we have a deep sense in our humanity, in our souls, in our spirit that there's more than meets the eye. And so this series, I'm going to aim at helping you so that you get your questions answered from God's Word so that you might be able to answer the questions that folks are asking. Now, at the same time I say that, that's one side of the coin, let me move over here and say, the enemy doesn't want you to find out any of this stuff. All right? So what I'm going to do today, if you're writing down a title for this sermon, is I'm going to share with you four things that Satan doesn't want you to know. And I am hoping that these four things, we are hoping that these four things are gonna equip you to be confident in what spiritual warfare is and how to step into it and how to not be scared. There's a lot of people that think, well, if I just leave it alone, it's kind of like parents raising kids around bees or wasps in the summertime. Just leave it alone, baby. If you leave it alone, it won't sting you. You don't bother it and it won't bother you. You've heard that, right? Yes, sir. That's not how it works with spiritual warfare, okay? And so what we're not going to do is be a bunch of ostriches at New Spring Church and just stick our head in the sand and act like it doesn't exist. That is some people's M.O. when it comes to spiritual warfare. And Satan's going, I love when they do that. They just act like I'm not even here. At the same time, we're not going to be like that little boy that uh, was scared of a monster in his closet and just pulls his head o the sheet over his head thinking it's not there, right? Uh, that's not who we are. That's not what we're going to do. We're going to expose and unpack this. And so I want to share with you four truths uh, to kind of get us ready around this that Satan's hoping you don't listen to. Now, as I say that, I want you to know this. Satan's going, shh, 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 shh. Hey, why don't you, why don't you look what's going on? What's going on in the PGA golf tournament this morning on your phone? Don't pay attention to the pastor. Just look what's happening on Instagram. Hey, why don't you think about where you're going to go to lunch? The enemy at the same time is hoping you're here today, but you're not going to be here next week. Or, Lord, 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 please, dads, don't be here on Father's Day in two weeks. Don't be here for that. You, you should take a week off, you know, go to the lake, go to the beach, grill something, take it off at church. It's your day, dads. That's what the enemy's hoping. But I want to challenge you. You're looking at me? Be here every week, seven weeks in a row. This starts our series that really is, this is the locker room of New Spring Church. Summertime, college kids have gone home. All the folks are getting out of the rhythm. The people that are in our buildings today, by and large, is the locker room of New Spring Church. And we're trying to set you up and get you ready so that you might be of service in the days to come. If you're ready for that, say, I'm ready. All right. So truth number one, that the enemy does not want you to know, that I believe God wants us to know about spiritual warfare is very simply stated that the war is real. The war is real. Ephesians 6, we just read it a moment ago, but Ephesians 6, pick it up in verse 10. It says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Another um, uh, translation says we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, this right now darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the 
heavenly places. I want to draw your attention to the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I want you to write this down. The war is not with people. The war is with angels. The war is in heavenly places. The war is not with people. The war, is, as a matter of fact, is with the angelic. It's with angels. The war is in heavenly places. Here's a principle that I've seen apply in my life, and I want you to test it. I think you'll see it to be true. Many times, if we are fighting in earthly places with our spouse, with our kids, on social media, with a coworker, if we're fighting in physical places, many times, if we're doing this in earthly places, we are actually losing the battle in heavenly spaces. One more time. If you see in your life, you are fighting, bickering, arguing, whether it be with words or whether it be with the the silent treatment or whether it be passive aggressive. If we're fighting in the physical spaces, what we actually see is that we're losing the battle in heavenly places. And so what we want to do is put you in a space where you understand what's going on. And the enemy loves division. He loves to get us fighting with humans, with flesh and blood. He loves to get us there. But, but what God wants to do is he wants to inform you and equip you that the actual solution to the physical fights and, and the physical uh, altercations we have, it, the actual solution is not a physical one. It's a spiritual one. And what we've got to do is we've got to pull the curtain back on the physical world and we've got to get behind it. And I want you to know that this is something that you can do. So let me get back to this. What's the origin of this? Where did this begin? And in order to understand that, let's go all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. And and what we need to know is that God... The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created the whole earth. And the Bible records in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that he created everything. And after everything he created, he he made a declarative. He would create something and say, it was good. It was good. I want everybody to say, it was good. It was good. It was good. And then he gets done with the whole thing. And he steps back and he goes, it's very good. And in the midst of it's very good in Genesis 1, And then we get to Genesis 3, something happens. And what happens is we see a rebellion occur. And what you need to know is that there was an angel, a worshiping angel named Lucifer. We know him as the devil, as Satan. Um, He's got a lot of different names in the scriptures. But this worshiping angel decided with pride in his heart, pride, by the way, is the sin behind every sin, that he wanted to be exalted, that he didn't want to exalt God anymore. And the minute that that happened in the heavenly places, God cast him down to earth. Now he shows up, and we see this in the garden, to Adam and Eve. And when he shows up in the garden to Adam and Eve, one of the things that he does that is so important, this is a principle of first mention, I want you to catch this, is he ends up deceiving them, duping them, tricking them. Let's use another SAT word. He, he, uh, uh, the word chicanery comes to mind. Some of you English teachers out there will be proud of that one. Okay, Chicanery, he dupes them, he tricks them. He, he, listen, watch this. He does not overwhelm Adam and Eve with power. He rather gets them to grant him permission. The war we're talking about is not a war of power. It's actually a war of permission. And so what What ultimately happens in the garden is the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, takes the word of God and he twists it. He uses some of it, but he gets Eve and Adam involved in a conversation where he doesn't overwhelm them with power. He doesn't win an arm wrestling contest or put them in a headlock and get them to tap out. He ends up getting them to give him permission. They are deceived. And then from that point forward, watch this. He steals the authority on this earth, in this world. Back in Genesis chapter 3, Satan steals the authority that Adam and Eve had been given from God. He takes the authority, and if you want to think of it as keys, he steals the keys of this world. And so from that point forward, we need to understand that the God of this world, and this is so important for us to grasp if we're going to understand spiritual warfare, the war is real, but the God of this world, listen, is Lucifer, is Satan, that he is operating with spiritual authority, and we just read about it there, with powers, principalities, 
in, in the heavenly spaces. He's creating things from the heavenly spaces that, that show up in the physical places and we live our lives fighting each other and we don't get behind the physical problems we have. We've got to get behind them in a spiritual realm. So our issue, church, if you're looking at me, is we've got to get to the, the heavenly places. We've got to get to the unseen spaces. We've got to get to the spiritual world, which brings me to truth number two. The war is real, but truth number two, I need you to write down, Satan doesn't want you to know this, is that Jesus has won the victory. All right? Jesus has won the victory. I know a minute ago, back up the tape, if you were listening, you could actually literally go and back up the tape. Two and a half minutes ago, I said that Satan, Lucifer, is the God of this world, and that caught some of you off guard, right? Maybe you've never heard that because you've been so bathed in Christianese language that you don't realize that when Adam and Eve sinned, the fall of humanity occurred, and, and because of that, uh, Lucifer, Satan, the enemy, he has keys. He has real authority in this world to create havoc. And so what we've got to understand is, and most people don't realize this, and I want you to catch this, is that when Jesus won the victory, most Christians don't actually know what happened at the cross. What did he say? Yeah. Most Christians don't know what actually happened at the cross. Most Christians, if we were to sit down today and we're to get a cup of coffee, maybe in Spartanburg or Columbia, we could all meet up in Columbia together, all 14 campuses. And we were to sit down, we'd, we'd ask the question, hey, what happened at the cross? And some people would rightly say, well, that's where Jesus forgave us of our sin. That's true. But not only did he forgive us of our sin there, not only did he resurrect in power, but watch this, he actually, when he resurrects in power, he takes back the keys that Satan had stolen from Adam and Eve, and now Jesus has now gained authority from Lucifer, and he has them, and he wants to give them to you and I, Christ follower. This is so important if you're gonna understand the origin of this whole conflict. He wants to give them to you. Maybe some of you are even thinking about the Great Commission. If you were raised in a Baptist church like I was, I feel like we talked about the Great Commission all the time, right? Matthew 28, therefore go into all nations. But do you know what it says before Jesus says, therefore go? What's it say? Anybody remember? There it is. All authority has been given to me, therefore go. Thank you, Miss Dixon. All authority has been given to me, therefore go. So Jesus Christ, upon resurrection, he is the one who has stolen back the keys from Lucifer. He's established his authority here. And he invites us, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, those born again, not of the first Adam and Eve, but of the new Adam, Jesus, to walk out in his spirit in authority. Most Christians don't understand that that's what's going on. That's exactly why Paul writes to the church in Colossians chapter 2. And he says these words in Colossians 2.15. Look at the words and the way he uses the words. Colossians 2.15, Paul writes about this. He says this, he, he there is God the Father, God the Father disarmed the rulers and authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Leave that passage up there. I want everybody to look at this. God the Father, through Christ the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, took back the authority at the cross the cross is so powerful. I need you to understand this, Christian. The cross is so powerful. It did not just buy you a ticket to heaven one day. It's so powerful, it's able to give you the authority of heaven today to cause heaven to break out in your community right now. You gotta catch this. Mom and dad, hell's been breaking out at your house. It's time to let some heaven break out, amen? Hey, hey, coworker, you've been having some fights at your office. It's time to let hell not break out, but, but heaven to break out in your office. All right? This is how you're going to do it. You're going to walk in the Spirit of God by the power of God. It's not going to happen with a physical solution. It's going to happen because you learn how to fight in the heavenly spaces. So number one, the war is real. Number two, Jesus Christ has won the victory. Um, before I get there, I've got one story to tell you about. I know some of you guys, are there any history buffs? Anybody like the History Channel? Like if I came to your house, okay, a lot of y'all. Me too, man. I love the History Channel. I love American history. Um, I, uh, I love reading up on it. I love um, watching history documentaries about it. One of the times and periods I just think is super fascinating is, is you know, in the early 1900s, right? Because we're living in the wake of a lot of that. But there was, there was this fella in the early 1900s that was famous. He actually, maybe more specifically, is infamous because he led one of the most infamous 
prison breaks in all of American history. This guy's name is John Dillinger. Some of y'all know about John Dillinger. But he was, he was like that Chicagoland mobster group, like Al Capone and Babyface and John Dillinger. These guys were bank robbers. Envision in your head uh, the craziness. It's kind of been romanticized, right, of, of like uh, Dick Tracy and Tommy Guns and that kind of thing. But it was real life. Well, John Dillinger, he led one of the most famous jailbreaks of all time. And the way he did it was he had actually performed a bank robbery in the Midwest. He ran out to Arizona to hide. The FBI caught up with him, extradites him back to Indiana where he had done the actual, uh, the deed. And he was in a prison that was uh, proclaimed as an inescapable prison. Nobody had ever escaped from this prison. Well, that was until they met John Dillinger. Well, John Dillinger ends up leading a jailbreak and they didn't know how he did it. Had no idea. How did he do it? They find out from one of the hostages that he took when he let him go that he had actually in his prison cell. Now, if you read up on this, some people don't know if his lawyer brought this to him or if he actually made it himself. We'll go with the romanticized big fish story for church purposes today. But he fashioned a wooden gun, painted it black with shoe polish. And when the prison guard came in to bring his meal and to bring him and to clean out his latrine, he held hostage the prison guard with a fake gun. Was able to talk that prison guard into getting one of his other guard buddies to open the cell. Was able to then commandeer a real gun and he was able to dupe and deceive and get permission from 33 prison officers. He led a prison break and escaped from the inescapable jail. Here's Here's the whole point. But he did it with a fake gun. He did it with fake authority. He did it the same way Lucifer operates in our lives today. Our enemy does not, in Jesus Christian, I'm talking to you, he does not have power and authority in your life anymore, but he's not going to tell you that. He's just going to hold up fake, imposter, counterfeit weapons and see if you will give him permission to create hell and havoc in your home, in your family, in your legacy, in your job, in our communities, on your social media timeline, and everywhere else. He operates by counterfeit, imposter, fakeness. And it's time that you and I woke up to the reality that you're the one holding the keys in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. So the war is real. Jesus has won the victory. Here's truth number three that Satan's hoping you don't hear today at New Spring Church. He's hoping you don't write this down. He's hoping you don't listen to what I'm saying right now. In this war, there is no neutral. There is no neutral. Now, those of you from uh, back in uh, like the boomer age, you'll remember uh, this phrase, uh, you know, if somebody claimed to be a Switzerland, there's no Switzerland. That, you know, Switzerland was famous in World War II to being neutral. They didn't pick a side, right? They, no, no, we don't want to deal with the war. We don't want to pick a side. We'll just say we're neutral. We're neutral. Um, uh, today in modern era, there's actually another country that was neutral. This country, maybe some of you have even seen this on the news. Finland had declared its neutrality uh, back on the post-World War II, Cold War era. They were neutral. They didn't want to join NATO and go up against Russia. They just said, we're going to be neutral. We're going to be neutral. They've actually run polls on this, and six months ago, they happened to poll the country of Finland and asked how many of the people in Finland would want Finland to join NATO, to like agree that they were going to all, if one of them was attacked, they all would act like they were attacked. And less than 20% of the population of Finland six months ago wanted to actually be a part of NATO. They ran one of these polls just a few weeks ago, and it's actually flipped now. Over 80%, right at 80% of the population of Finland today, if you polled them, would say, I want to be a part of NATO. We, we want in. We want in. Can we join? Now, some of you already know why. But the reality is because there's this huge aggression that's occurred in the earth that we're living in right now. And that huge aggression was not overt or covert. It was overt, right? The minute that the Russian army started firing and marching into the nation of Ukraine, all of a sudden people went, oh, wow, I thought we'd move past this whole world war thing. I thought these sovereign lines on the maps were the thing where everybody was going to go by. But now people in Finland, you know what they're recognizing, church? You can't be neutral. You better, you better understand that there is an aggressor that is at your door. Here's what I want to say to you. The enemy wants you to think if you don't bother him, he won't bother you. And it's the biggest lie he's selling today. You need to know he's not just covert in your life 
or overt in your life. He's covert and overt in all of the fronts. He's coming at you, okay? I'm mixing up my words, but you get what I'm trying to say. He's coming at you. He is an aggressor. He wants to kill your marriage. He wants to kill your kids. He wants to kill everything he can because Jesus said that the enemy came to kill, steal, and destroy. And there is no neutral ground. And oh, by the way, if you're here today and go, Pastor, I'm not even really religious, man. My friend brought me today. I'm, I'm just watching online because somebody told me, you know, that, that, that it would be enjoyable. I, I'm, I'm not really involved in this whole thing. I want you to know, if you think that, you're already on the other team. That's what the scripture tells us. I'm going to show it to you in Ephesians chapter 2. Right before Paul writes these words in Ephesians 6 about the spiritual warfare that we're reading about, he said this just four chapters earlier in Ephesians 2. Look at these words about where the war is. He's talking to the people in the church of Ephesus, and he says to all of them, the church people, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, look, 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 following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's a reference to Satan and his authority. See that? Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now, everybody say now, now at work in the sons of disobedience. Watch this. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Leave that up there for just a moment if you don't mind up in A control. I want everybody to see me say this. One of the lies that is in the earth today is that every human being on the planet is a child of God. This says, right there, that last phrase, that we aren't actually by birth children of God. We are children of wrath like the rest of mankind. That we've actually been born following the prince of the power of the air. Following in the the lineage of the sons and daughters of disobedience. Because we're all, listen to me, from birth, not children of God. Now we've been created in the image of God. But because of sin and brokenness in our past, we were born into a world where we are children of wrath. There is no neutral ground. There is no no fire zone. If you have been asleep to this reality, wake up today. It's God's love that he's waking you up. Today, you can become a child of God, but that happens in faith when you are born again. That's why Jesus uses that word when he's talking to Nicodemus in John 3. He says, you've got to be born again. So that you're not a child of wrath. So that you're not operating by the spirit of disobedience. So you're not following the the principality of this world. But instead you now have been born of the spirit. You know today in in the church calendar, in the liturgical church calendar, we are celebrating Pentecost. This is uh, seven weeks and a day past Easter. Seven weeks ago was Easter. All over the world today, people are celebrating Pentecost. The reason, listen, that the Holy Spirit was given was so that you and I might be born again and we would operate in a new spirit, looking to a new king, following his ways, establishing his kingdom in the earth, not our own spirit. So important that we get this, but there's no neutral ground. So I just, this is only point number three. We got one more left, but I just want to pause right here. I want to ask a question because I believe you'll know this when you answer this in your heart. Look at me. Whose side are you on today? If we're talking about spiritual warfare, you need to know that the line has been drawn. And whether we recognize it or not, there's a battle line. And if we've just been born once of our human nature, we are said to be on a side, on the enemy side. And we're going to continue to follow his orders We're going to continue to follow his temptations. We're going to continue to follow his ways. And we will by nature be children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We all were once there. This is not for special people. It doesn't matter how many times you've been to church or what your pedigree is, how much money you've got in the account or the trust fund or wherever you are and whatever you think gets you there. Every person has to be born again of Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Now, that's not popular to talk about in a lot of churches anymore, but I'm telling you that is Christianity 101. You've got to receive by faith the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, and you've got to deal with your nature, your born inherent nature, mine too. And that's part of spiritual warfare. And so I want you today to be born again if you've not been born again, okay? Today's the day that you can move to being a child of God, all right? So that was point number three. Point number four, and we're almost there. 
Point number four is, this is so good, is that victory is guaranteed if we stand firm. I wanna guarantee you victory. All this conversation about a battle and war and oh my goodness, it can create anxiety in our hearts, right? When we think about unseen worlds and angelic forces and principalities. And I mean, that's what the language says. That's kind of scary, pastor. Hey, look at me. Let peace reign in your heart because victory is guaranteed because Jesus Christ has already sealed the deal when he got up from the grave at Easter, amen? It's guaranteed. Don't let fear dwell in your heart. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind, and it's yours in Jesus Christ. But you need to understand that you've got to stand firm. I need somebody to be honest today. This is one of those embarrassing questions, but it's not rhetorical. How many of you followed at some level the Johnny Depp case on Twitter, on social media. Look at this place in here. There's some proud people here. Oh, I did. That girl's crazy. You know, whatever. I don't want to get too involved there, but I do want to bring a legal term up. In a previous life, I was, I was, a, I was a pre-law student, okay? So I had to take constitutional law and all these courses and, and uh, learned a phrase. Maybe you know this phrase because you've been watching Johnny Depp. You know he can't be tried again, right? Or maybe you've just tuned into some CSI through the years, all right? But here's the phrase. You ready for it? Double jeopardy. Y'all know what that phrase means? It means that once someone is declared innocent, they can't be declared guilty. You can't be tried for the same thing again. Now, why is that important? Well, the reality is, if you're in Christ, Jesus was declared guilty on your behalf, and that's why he was dead and punished on the cross. And you, therefore, cannot be declared guilty ever again. He died your death. He went, listen, he went to hell on your behalf. But when he went to hell, he actually had the power and authority of a perfect life to take the keys back from Satan and resurrect it in power three days later. And now his forgiveness is so powerful. Look at me. He hasn't just forgiven your past sins. He's forgiven the sins you didn't even know you were going to commit next week. If you're in Christ, the power of his grace and forgiveness is timeless. The Bible talks about salvation isn't just something in the past. That's called justification. It talks about it's working something in the present. That's called sanctification. And it's talking about a salvation in the future. That's called glorification. I'm just taking y'all on a little drive through theology today, okay? You need to know this. If you are in Christ, it doesn't matter how you feel. And feelings dictate a lot too much, I'm, I'm afraid, to a lot of Christians. If the sun is shining, we feel good. If, if they're playing the song I like on a Sunday morning, oh, my hands are up. If things are going good at work and my doctor's report's going well, but listen to me. In Christ, you are in charge of your feelings. The truth of God has put you in a position of authority. And I just want to encourage you over this summer, start telling your feelings what to do with the truth of God. Mom and dad, you got to start leading your home like this. Husbands, you got to start leading your family like this. Single men, you got to start leading your community like this. Feelings are not in charge. Now, they're powerful. They're real. You cannot ignore them, but you've got to put them in line. Cause them to submit to the truth of God's word. And the truth is, Jesus Christ has paid for your past, present, and future sins, and that is part of the spiritual battle. And if you will stand firm, victory is guaranteed. Because the enemy, his end is already written. That's why God gave us the book. Amen? Now, uh, that's the four truths. Now, let me just tell you in closing some things that aren't just eternally valuable but immediately practical, okay? I wanna give you four things that you can do this week, all right, so that you might be able to take advantage of this. Um, I've had the opportunity to go to Israel seven times. Uh, it's been an incredible deal. Uh, we actually had several trips that were canceled because of COVID, but if you're looking on the website at newspring.cc slash Israel, we have one open for the spring. It's almost full, I think. But anyway, side note, going back to Israel, can't wait. It's gonna be exciting. But here's the whole deal. Every time we've gone, we've leaned into some, some teachers there and, and some Messianic Jewish teachers there specifically. And the people of Israel, they're different than the people of America. In Israel, maybe some of you know this, especially if you're in military families, you have to serve in the military. Doesn't matter if you're men or if you're women, okay? Male or female, you serve in the military there. You know why? Because they have 13 nations that have historically not wanted them on the planet. So you have to learn how to handle warfare. 
So they have, they have raised the IDF, that's their Israeli defense force, the IDF, every single man and woman, husband and wife, doesn't matter if they're grandparent age or, or middle age or, or their kids looking forward to it, they know how to engage in military battle. And so they have a citizen army. Now, here's what I want to make sure you catch. Spiritual warfare is not for the veteran Christians. It's for every Christian. God is raising a church that is an army. Men and women, young and old, there is no JV team here. And what you need to understand is when Paul wrote these words, if you back up and you look in your text, if you're looking at a hard text just like I've got right here, Ephesians 6 is written to husbands and wives. Like right before this in my Bible, it's like husbands love your wives. Kids obey your parents. To masters and bond servants. He's talking to everyday people. This is not the varsity Christian letter. It's to everyday people, men and women. He's raising a citizen army. Okay, so I want you to catch that. But here's what happens, and this is what they train the IDF when they understand that they could be attacked at any time. You could be a grandparent, or you could be a mom and dad, or you don't even have to be in the military. Here's what could happen at any time if you're attacked upon. Here's the four rules of engagement, all right? Rule number one of engagement. If you're attacked, if you're shot upon, you need to find cover. Everybody say, find cover. You gotta find cover. Rule number two in this citizen army, if you have been shot upon, you gotta find cover. Rule number two is you gotta shoot back. You can't just keep your head down. You gotta move into an aggressive posture. You gotta shoot back. Rule number three is you're not gonna remain alone. You're actually gonna organize with others. And rule number four, you're gonna advance on the enemy. All right, I want everybody to read those. When you are waged war against, you need to find cover. Two, you've got to be the aggressor and move into a place of taking back ground. Shoot back. Number three, you're not going to do it alone. You're going to organize with others. And rule number four, you're going to advance on the enemy. I want you to know this is a beautiful, utilitarian way to take what you've heard today and apply it to your everyday relationship to Jesus. This is not just eternally valuable, it's immediately practical in your home tomorrow, on your vacation this week, uh, at your work. You're going to find cover. What's the cover of the Christian? It's Jesus Christ. He's your cover. You're going to find cover. He died the death so you don't have to. You're here today, you've never received Jesus, find cover in him. Find grace in him, find mercy in him, find eternal life in him find cover. It's not just in Jesus. You need to find cover in your church. You need to find a pastor in your life. You need to find a small group leader. You need to be covered. All right. There's real practicality here. How, how do you move to a second? The second uh, uh, point here of engagement is how do you fire back at the enemy? You need to learn some spiritual disciplines. How do you find cover? And then how do you shoot back? Listen, what if this summer was the summer of your, of your family reading through the gospels? or of you putting down the Netflix and picking up the scriptures, or you getting that devotional life where you get up in the morning and you read with your family, or you maybe you're in college and you're not gonna have schoolwork this summer, but you can get up before you work your job all summer long. You need to get some spiritual disciplines. You've gotta get aggressive on the enemy. He's not gonna just back up, okay? Find cover in Jesus, and you've gotta start being an aggressor. Number three, you're gonna organize with others. What if this summer you made it a summer where you really fought intentionally to get in community, get in a circle? Can I ask you something? Look at me. Are you in a circle right now? Do you have community in your life? Is this the only spiritual moment of your week? Or are there brothers or sisters that you group text? Are there golf buddies that you talk to? Are there, are there girlfriends that you connect with? Is there, there a men's group or a women's group? I know all of our campuses have them available. What if this summer was the summer where you organized with others and you got yourself in a position where you're ready to go on mission? That's how you advance on the enemy. I hope that through the course of these seven weeks, locker room of New Spring Church, that you would take advantage of finding cover, getting aggressive to the enemy, organizing with others, and advancing on the mission of the church. Because listen, there's some things the enemy doesn't want you to know. But guess what? We've preached them loud and clear this morning. So now it's our turn to go and apply it. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, here's what I want to do. I want to get you to keep your seat. Our worship teams are going to come. And here's what I want to do. In response today, I'm going to invite you, if you know now, I want to invite you to keep your seat. Please keep your seat if this is not serious for you. But if you know that you want to stand firm in the truths you've heard today and through this series on behalf of your family, 
on behalf of your, your roommates, on behalf of your community. If you want to stand firm in just a moment when the worship team comes out, I want you to stand to your feet with intentionality, okay? So worship teams, they're coming. The lights are up. But if today is the day you say, I want to stand firm and win the battle in spiritual warfare, as a sign of accountability, I want you to stand to your feet with intention right now. And I'm going to pray for you. Don't stand because everybody else is standing. Stand because you're taking it seriously. The war is real. Christ has won the victory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing, and we're going to go to war, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and authorities in the heavenly places. It's going to look so different than other people's fights because we're fighting with our worship. We're fighting with the word. We're fighting in prayer. We're fighting with our forgiveness. We're fighting with a kind word. When somebody speaks a harsh word, we're fighting in a different way, but we're gonna do it. Let me pray for every one of you. Father God, thank you for your church. Thank you for these truths that we've heard today. Lord, I pray that they would not just be eternally valuable, but Lord, that they'd be immediately practical. That every single person here today would find cover in Christ. That they would figure out how they can be aggressive against the enemy and fight back, how they cannot be alone and organize with others. Lord, I pray for friendships and accountability over the summer. And Lord, that we might live on mission today, that we might live on mission in the years to come as we advance on the enemy, taking back the ground and the authority that you bought at the cross. Do it for your glory. Do it for our joy. Do it for the world's good. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Come on, church. Let's sing. This is how I fight my battles And this is how I fight my battles And this is how I fight my battles Know that you're singing from a place of victory, come on This is how I fight my battles Here we go surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you it may look like I'm surrounded but I'm surrounded by you and this is how I fight my battles this is how I fight i yeah.
good. You're good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, God, that this is how we fight our battles. Um, God, thank you for the word we just received. God, help us do something with it. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Hey, two thoughts I have is like, we say this every week. What is God saying to you? What is God saying to you right now? From what uh, Pastor Brad talked about, what is, what is God saying to you? And if he's saying something to you, you know, write, go ahead and write it down. Write it in your notes app, write it down in your journal. What is God saying to you? And the next question is, what are you going to do about it? That's a question I have to ask myself. You know, what is God saying to me? What did God say to me during that message, and what are you going to do about it? And I just want to encourage you um, just to do something with what God said, um, because it's good. It's good. It's good. So Coop, thank you, Pastor Brad. Thank you for that. That was incredible. I think that was a that was a word that was a word that our entire house needed um, for the day and age that we live in. So thank you so much for that. Um, and guys, I'm about to break the fourth wall really quick. But the weekend. This is the last Sunday to sign up for the weekend. Hey, can you raise your hand if you were at the weekend last year, if you were a volunteer, uh, if you were a student, if you served and say anything like that? There we go, there we go. Last year I was a group leader and I've been a part of summer camps here since, I feel so old, since 2014, 2015. Um, and I'll say that God does not disappoint at all, every time. That every single time, something beautiful and wonderful happens. Whenever like students in high school and middle school are there, something special always happens. Uh, so here in Anderson, we have over 250 people who have already said yes to going. Um, and if you are a parent in here, my one thing to say is sign your baby up. For real. For real, sign your baby up for the weekend. There's a, there's a table outside um, that one of our staff members would be at that if you want to sign them up, you can. Uh, also, you can text the weekend to 30303. These are the dates. You can go to the weekend.cc. Um, but if you don't hear anything else, sign your baby up. If you are a student in here, if your parents have not signed you up yet, tell them, poke them right now. Say, hey, can you please sign me up for the weekend? If you know anybody who needs to go to the weekend as well, um, encourage them to go as well. But yes, I'm so excited for the weekend. It's going to be so much fun. And also, um, as you guys leave, you're going to get a handout uh, for our summer calendar um, and our summer celebration, all these things that are happening in our church. Um, so before you leave, there also should be a QR code on the screen. Maybe there is. Yes, yeah, so you can scan this QR code so you can get it digitally. Uh, but also, you will get it when you walk out. There will be a couple things on this. Um, it'll be things about our summer celebration and so many things happening across the entire summer. The biggest thing, in my opinion, is that these things are meant to help cultivate fellowship and family and community within this community that we are in here in Anderson. So I just want to encourage you. Invite some friends. Come to these things. It's going to be a good time. Um, and I'm so excited. Also, today, if God spoke to you in any way, if you need prayer, there will be four tables in the back as you walk out that there will be people stationed at as well that you guys can talk to. There we go. How's everybody feeling? Everybody good? Everybody good? We said a lot. The weekend. What is God saying to you? All those type of things. But before we guys leave, before we leave, I want to bless you guys. Um, so can we all just open up our hands? I'm going to read some scripture from Ephesians 3. This is going to be beautiful. So Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. See you guys next Sunday.